Uh, hi, welcome everyone to another uh, great art, arts and lecture uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Victor Tam, I'm the Dean of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics here at Santa Rosa Junior College, and it's my honor and pleasure um, to introduce Laura Sparks, uh, Professor of Astronomy here at SRJC. Um, just a little quick information about Laura. Um, she got her bachelor's um, in physics at Arizona State University before going on to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, um, where she also got a degree in physics but uh, studied high energy astrophysics. She's been here at SRJC for 10 years teaching astronomy. Um, and what you're going to hear about today, last summer she was selected to participate uh, in the Astronomy uh, in Chile Educational Ambassadors Program, uh, which granted her behind the scenes access to some of the most cutting ed edge astronomy facilities in the world. So this is gonna be a really, really interesting talk. Um, she served as chair of the Earth and Space Sciences uh, Department from 2016 to 2019, and um, you were able to catch our show at the uh, planetarium this past winter. Um, Laura also presented a, uh, a talk on um, uh, on, an inter on the first interstellar comet. Um, and then personally, uh, this past uh, summer, Laura and I uh, went up to Robert Burst observ Observatory, and I can attest to how great of uh, an astronomy uh, instructor she is, because um, I'm not an astronomer, I'm a chemist, and so there are a lot of things I don't know about the stars, and so she gave, uh, she gave a very good uh, tutorial <laughs> on, on looking at the nighttime sky. So, um, welcome everyone, and uh, without uh, much delay, Professor Laura Sparks. Thank you so much. to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, um, they told me to tell you not to have any drinks in here. And they also said, please don't let anybody go behind the, the screen and behind the curtain. So I respectfully ask you not to storm the stage, I guess. I don't think I wasn't really worried about that, but they told me to say it. Uh, so today, I'd like to talk to you about astronomy in Chile. Uh, and I'm going to go through four main things. First of all, why is there so much astronomy in Chile? It's estimated that within the next 10 years, 70% of the professional astronomy that's done in the world will be in Chile. So it's sort of like the global hotspot for astronomy right now. So I want to talk about why that is. Um, I'd also like to talk to you about the observatories in Chile that are funded by the National Science Foundation. Now, why care about that? Well, the National Science Foundation is the premier American government funded science organization. So when I say NSF funded, I mean your tax dollars are paying for these observatories in Chile. So I want you to know about them and what you're helping to support when you pay taxes. We're going to talk about um, this concept called interferometry, which is a really tricky, interesting way to use telescopes to see deeper into the universe than ever before. And I'd really like to focus all throughout the talk on the incredible amount of international, worldwide cooperation that has to happen in order for these big projects to work. So those are the main things I'd like to hit on today. So first of all, why Chile? OK, well, Chile is a beautiful country, and the sky in Chile is phenomenal. It looks a lot different to look at the stars there than it does here. In fact, there are tons of, we visited a small town when I went last summer to Chile. We visited a small town called San Pedro de Atacama. And there were tons of these little astrotourism shops set up all over the place. Like you could go out to like um, on little four-wheeled vehicles out into the desert, or you could go on a hiking expedition, or you could go on an astronomy expedition. And there were actually more like little astronomy tourism shops than any of the other kinds. It was kind of amazing. So what makes um, what makes astronomy in Chile so special? Well, there's two main reasons that all, all these big telescopes are getting built there. And the first reason has to do with its location really far south on the Earth. And if you could bring the lights down, please. Thank you so much. OK, I want to teach you just a little bit about what the sky looks like from here, like in Santa Rosa, if you were to go out and look at the stars at night, and compare that to what it looks like in Chile, where it's a lot different. So here we are. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but here we are on the globe, uh, pretty far up in the northern hemisphere. Now, the ancient Greeks 
thought that the Earth was contained inside of this giant crystal sphere that had stars stuck to the sphere. They thought that all of the stars were the same distance away from planet Earth. And we know that that's not true, but their model that they used to kind of visualize how things worked is still pretty, pretty good, a pretty good way to think about the sky and help us sort of visualize how the stars look. So let me bring up some stars and see if you guys can uh, recognize them. Three, two of the most famous groups of stars you can see in the Northern Hemisphere are the Big Dipper and Orion. How many of you can, can spot the Big Dipper out at night? Yeah. Okay, how many of you can spot Orion's belt? Okay, great, so you know what I'm talking about. Now, how many of you have ever seen the Southern Cross? A Couple people, a few people? Okay, so if you've seen the Southern Cross, it means that you've been pretty far south on the globe because here's this little stick, stick figure guy is supposed to represent a person, like basically where we are. Actually, let me move the location over to California. Um, and for us, the Southern Cross is just down below the horizon all the time because basically, if you imagine the Earth as a globe like this, there are stars out away from our planet in all directions, three-dimensional, right? So if you're up on the northern hemisphere, you only really get to see the stars that are up in this direction in space. There's just as many stars down that direction, but in order to see them from here, you need to have tunnel vision to look all the way through the Earth to the other side of the world, because they're blocked by uh, planet Earth from us. So if we want to see the Southern Cross, we're just kind of out of luck here because as the Earth spins, and you can see the Earth kind of turning around here in this animation, it looks to us as though the stars are rising and setting. Now, it's not really the stars that are moving, obviously. It's the Earth that's moving. But anyway, there's this illusion of the stars moving around. Now, let's check out the Southern Cross. It just barely misses it. You just can't quite see it. I think if you were to go like down to San Diego, you might be able to just barely catch one of the little piece of it peeking over the horizon. But where we are this far north in California, you can't see them. So now let's go down to Chile. I'm going to drag our location all the way down here to this. T I'm going to go pretty far to the tip of South America. And now the stars are going to look pretty different. So let's check out the Big Dipper <laughs> and uh, I'll start the animation. So if you live in Chile, down near the very south tip of it, just barely misses. You're never going to be able to see the Big Dipper because it's down too far, too far in the south for you. However, you will get to see Orion. Uh, and if you're really, really, really paying attention, you can notice that it's flipped upside down. <laughs> if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, Orion like, looks backwards from how it does here. And then you get to see the Southern Cross. Okay, so let's take a look at how that would appear to us in the night sky. Now, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey into uh, what I do at the JC. So I frequently teach these short-term astronomy classes. There might be some students in here who have taken Astronomy 12 or signed up for it. It's a weekend class that we go out to Lake Sonoma and we look at the stars and spend a whole weekend doing that. There have been countless times where we are up there at the lake, well, not the students, but the teachers are up there at the lake till like two or three in the morning because we've got to pack everything up and load up the trucks and everything before we drive home. And then once we get on the road to come home, it might be 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning in the summertime. So I've gotten really used to this one phenomenon because I've done the class so many times, which is if you're driving south through the Lake Sonoma Recreation Area at 3 in the morning in June, Scorpius is right in front of your, uh, in, the, in your windshield. And you can actually see Scorpius. If you turn your headlights off, you can see it even better. But I'm usually driving a school vehicle, so I try not to do that. Uh, but anyway, let me show you what this looks like. I'll zoom in a little. and Maybe you can spot this shape of the scorpion. There's this tail coming up here and the stingers on the scorpion. And there have been so many, probably a dozen times in my life that I've been kind of heading home, uh, looking towards the south and seeing Scorpius. Now if you let, actually, just in case you can't see it too clearly, let me bring up some markings. I kind of think the scorpion in here looks a little like a cockroach, but kind of gets the job done. So there's the scorpion. And then there's another famous constellation called Sagittarius in the south. Now I'm going to turn on the motion of the Earth so that this is going to simulate the Earth spinning. And you'll be able to see how the stars move gradually through the sky. So what happens in June is you look towards the south and you see Scorpius coming up in the south and you see Sagittarius coming up. They rise up just a little bit above the horizon. You can see kind of like the trees outlines in the background there. They're not really getting very high up in the sky. 
turn the speed up. And then later on in the evening, they set in the southwest. They never get very high up. So for me, and that's just based on our location, right? This would look different if we were somewhere else on planet Earth. But here in Santa Rosa, every summer, that's how they look. So for me, I'm very much used to, uh-oh, the sun's coming up. <laughs> we don't want that. OK, I'm very much used to Scorpius and Sagittarius are low in the sky. Now, many of you probably don't have that association. Maybe this is the first time you've even thought about Sagittarius. That's fine. So I want you to think about where you are used to seeing trees. Where are they normally? Trees. On the ground, right? Would it freak you out if you saw a tree straight overhead? Like, not just like the branches, but like a whole, you could look up and, oh my god, there's an oak tree. Like, wouldn't that freak you out? OK, so when I went to Chile, that's basically what happened to me. Because uh, I'm going to change our uh, location here and take us down to Chile. Oops. Right about there. And let's make it nighttime. So we went out uh, basically about the end of July. And we looked for some stars and went outside to look at the stars. And I looked into the south to try to find Scorpius. Of course, I knew it wouldn't be there, but that's where I'm used to looking for it. And then I couldn't find it, so I started looking up and up and up <laughs> and up and up. And oh my god, there was Scorpius and Sagittarius like pretty much straight overhead. And I, I know it might sound very odd to you, but I actually like cried. <laughs> like I got so emotional seeing them overhead because it was such a weird thing. Um, I knew intellectually that they wouldn't be along the ground, but it freaked me out. Just like I said, like just like seeing a tree in the sky would maybe freak you out. It, it made me feel really weird. So that was very interesting. OK, so why care about this? Going back to my main point, why do we put observatories in Chile? Well, there are a lot of really interesting things in the sky right next to Sagittarius. Does anybody know something interesting? Maybe an astronomy student? I think some of you might be getting extra credit to be here. So hopefully you know something about this. What's that? Towards the center of our galaxy, exactly. The galactic center of the Milky Way galaxy is right in Sagittarius. And there's a supermassive black hole there that's about 4 million times more massive than the sun, right smack dab in Sagittarius. So if you want to study Sagittarius, isn't it better to be somewhere where you can point a telescope up at the sky and see it clearly? Instead of here in Santa Rosa, you'd have to like point it just barely above the trees in the southern horizon and catch it just a little bit in the summer. So there's just such a better view of a lot of things in the sky um, in Chile. So that's one of the big reasons that there are so many observatories there. OK, now while I've got this, these stars up, I just want to show you one more thing. Um, and then we'll, we'll bring the lights back up. So let's go back to Santa Rosa, because I want to give you Three things to look at that you can connect to this talk. And then when you go out into the, um, in, at night, tonight, or maybe later this week when the weather's clear, um, you can go out and actually see some of the th these things for yourself and then remember what you heard about in this talk. So let's bring it to today's date and make it about, oh, about 8 PM. OK, so I'm going to give you a list of things to learn. I want you to memorize these three things, just three things. It's easy. And then sometime this week, I hope that you'll notice them in the sky. And you'll see that, and it'll connect back to what you heard today. OK, so first of all, if you go and look in the south this evening or some night this week, you should see the beautiful constellation of Orion. Real beautiful right there in the southern sky. Can't miss it. Now, up above Orion's left shoulder is this constellation called Gemini, the twins. Some of you, that might be like your sun sign, your astrological sign, Gemini. OK, we're going to see the word Gemini later on. So if you uh, go out this week, try to spot those twins Gemini. It looks like kind of two stick figures in the sky. And then just above, be, uh, above Orion's right shoulder is this constellation called Taurus that looks basically shaped like a V. And it's going to be right by the moon tonight. If you go out tomorrow night, the moon will move. It tends to do that. Um, but tonight, the moon will be right by Taurus. OK, so those are two things to remember. Above Orion's left shoulder, you're going to see what? Gemini, the twins. Above the right shoulder, you're going to see Taurus. And then if you look a different direction and wait a little later in the evening and look towards the, oh, wrong way, look towards the east, 
you're going to see this really bright star called Arcturus. It almost looks like an airplane coming at you because the, the light from it is so bright and sort of got a reddish color. And then just in this area, there's a super massive galaxy. It's like the most giant galaxy you could imagine. And it's right there. Now, the bad news is you can't see it with the naked eye. <laughs> you need a telescope. And whoa, there it is. Awesome. But then in the, in the sky, it looks like that. So what you can do is just point to the east and look at some random spot and go, whoa, M M87, giant galaxy. I'm looking at it. OK, so above Orion's left shoulder, Gemini. Above the right shoulder, Taurus. And then in the east, giant galaxy, super giant galaxy. OK, we're going to come back to all three of those things later in the talk. And if you could bring the lights back up, we're done with the dark portion. Okay, so one more thing about the southern sky that's just sort of interesting and I thought you might want to see is the, d the way that different cultures saw the stars and saw pictures in the sky. So I just pointed out to you some sort of stick figure shapes in the sky and the scorpion and the twins and, and Orion. In the southern hemisphere, the disk of the Milky Way galaxy is so, so visible, like so much better than it is here, that cultures in the south saw pictures not in the stars or the shapes of the stars, but in the dark parts of the Milky Way galaxy. So if you look at this beautiful glow here and there's all this like darkness in front of it, this is all dust that's blocking out the light of billions of stars behind it. And in that dust, ancient people in Chile saw a llama. I want you to see if you can spot a llama animal in that dust. I'll give you a hint. It's sort of like got a Picasso-like head and those are the two eyes. So there's the eyes of the llama, and then the long neck, and then to the legs there. So leg, 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 long neck, and then weird, the eyes are kind of weird. It's like he's turned his head staring at you. Um, can we bring the, the lights back up, please? Thank you. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to show you that because you can't see that here. That's something you can really only see in the, in the southern hemisphere. OK, so first of all, Chile's in the south. So we get a great view of a bunch of things that you can't see in the northern hemisphere. And then the second reason it's so special is that it is very, very, very dry <laughs> in certain parts of it. And it has a high elevation. So take a look at this. This is an aerial photo. Well, it's more than an aerial photo. It's a space photo. <laughs> this is a picture taken with the International Space Station. And you can actually see the solar panels of the space station there. Um, it, anyway, this is Chile, and you can see the clouds in the Pacific Ocean kind of budding right up to the, the coast, but not coming inward. And then the mountains just a little east, this is on, at east and this is west on the picture. So the mountains in the east are blocking the clouds from the rainforest side from making it over. So Chile is like this very long strip of extremely dry land with mountains blocking the east part of it. It also surprisingly, I, I had never been to Chile before last summer, and when I went there, it looked exactly like California. It was crazy. So this is actually a picture taken in Chile, which I think if I had lied to you and said this was Sonoma County, you probably would have believed me, because it looks so similar. And it is really similar to California in that there's a coast, there's mountains, and there's different um, elevations and climates as you go up, microclimates as you go up. Uh, one other similarity to California is that since it's on the ocean, there's a oceanic plate, you know, like plate tectonics, plate coming down underneath the continental plate of Chile, just like we have here. And guess what that causes? Lots of earthquakes. So this was a picture of how far, if you look along the ground here, the only reason this equipment's in the picture is because it's really, really heavy. And um, that little stain there shows you how far it jumped during the last earthquake they had because it's just a really geologically active area just like California. So I actually felt a little bit short changed. I was like, man, I wanted to go somewhere totally different. It's just like the south version of California down here. But it was awesome. OK, so the first the uh, observatory that I want to show you, because now I remember I wanted to tell you about the NSF funded observatories that your tax dollars are paying for, um, is something called the Gemini Observatory. What is Gemini? What does Gemini mean? The, the it's a constellation of the twins. So the Gemini Observatory is a pair of telescopes. One of them's on the big island of Hawaii, and one of them is in Chile. 
that allow us to look at the in, almost the entire sky of stars, either above the north of the planet or below the south of the planet. They're twin 8.1 meter telescopes. OK, I want you to really internalize 8.1 meters. Can you picture how big that is? That's like mm, about 25 feet across. So imagine one telescope that's 25 feet in diameter. So these are huge, huge, monstrous telescopes. To get up to the Gemini Observatory, we had to take a really scary drive because the bus driver was extremely confident in his abilities as a driver. And he did not shy away from taking the turns uh, really, really, really quickly. So I just wanted to get you a feel of what it felt like to drive straight up. We started on the beach in the morning, and then we drove for three hours up into the mountains. And then I had to turn the camera off at this point because he was about to take this curve super fast, and I got really scared. And um, oh my god, okay, it's getting me scared actually just watching it again. And notice where they drive on the right side of the road in Chile. So the fact that he's on the left side of the road is not great. But um, OK. Uh, so then we got up to the Gemini Observatory. And here's what a modern telescope looks like from the outside. There will be a huge dome on the top of it. I remember how big this thing is. It's 25 feet across. So there has to be a whole building just built around it to protect it from wind and rain and the elements. And then they'll take a door on the top of the dome and open that door up. And you can just uh, see that on this picture here. This whole part will slide off, it's like slide backwards, and then the telescope can point out into the sky and, and look at things. Um, there's what it looks like on the inside. So basically, this is a reflecting telescope. So this door would open up. Light would come through this door. There's a huge mirror that you can't see from this angle that's right there. And the light from the mirror bounces up, hits that second mirror, and then goes down through a hole uh, in the telescope into one of these big detectors, like cameras on the back of it. So it's just this enormous piece of machinery. To do something this large in scale and this expensive, it's really hard for a single country to be able to afford it. So one of my favorite things about visiting the Gemini Observatory was seeing all the different flags that were hung there, because this is a project of, I believe, seven different countries to run this thing, of which America is just one. So there we've got the flags of Korea, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, the United States, and Chile, all working together to run this huge observatory. And I loved seeing, it, this feels like a time in our history when there's so much tension between countries, and I just love seeing so much cooperation globally. Uh, the, the telescope is an extremely complicated piece of equipment. So there was this readout that had all of this very detailed technical stuff that I couldn't quite understand. And then there's the version for dummies, was the telescope is good today. <laughs> like, everything's fine. I really liked that. So just to show you the sorts of things that you can see with such a huge telescope. This is a picture. It's one of the first pictures of such a small object um, of a planet around a star called 51 Eridani. So the, st oops, the star would be right here. And they were actually able to take a picture of about a Jupiter-sized planet that was orbiting around that star. Now, that might not seem like that big of a deal, but here's why it's crazy. Okay. Imagine looking into, you know when there's like a car dealership having a sale, they'll put up searchlights into the sky and kind of like point them around. Imagine one of those searchlights was pointed like straight at your face. You're like blinded by it. And then imagine you were trying to find or see a tiny little mosquito buzzing around outside of the searchlight. It'd be very, very difficult to see that, right? That's what a planet looks like around a star, right? Stars are so bright that the planets around them are almost impossible to see. So in order to take this picture, they used a special piece of equipment called a coronagraph to block out the starlight. And that's what that big disk in the middle is. That's actually the blank spot where they blocked everything out. And then that allows you to see kind of the fainter stuff around the edge. Around the edge. It takes an incredible telescope 25 feet across in order to be able to do something like this. Another thing they were able to find was um, they study objects within our own solar system. And they found that there was hydrogen sulfide gas in the atmosphere of Uranus. Now, the person I got to meet the director of Gemini, the Gemini Telescope, and he he told us that they put out a press release about this, and it just got no traction. Like nobody cared about the hydrogen gas and or the hydrogen sulfide in Uranus's atmosphere. So they realized it was like a branding or like a wording issue. They changed the headline and put the headline out again, <laughs> and suddenly like every news outlet in the world was picking it up, and it got all this good press. So there you go. 
hydrogen cyanide. Okay, hydrogen sulfide, I mean. All right, from, uh, from, your, from the Gemini telescope, you could actually just look out over the railing and get this view where you can see the Pacific Ocean off in the distance. So these telescopes are actually not that far. Remember, we drove all the way from the beach up here in about three hours. And then the, the first afternoon when we went to see Gemini, they told us, oh, by the way, after we see Gemini, we're not staying here. We're going to go over to this other observatory uh, for dinner. And then I was like, oh, OK, that's great. That means we're going to drive on that little road, aren't we? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I took some like anti-anxiety medication, and then we went on our drive to the next observatory and got there just in time for sunset. All right, so the next place we visited that's also funded by your tax dollars is a place called the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Inter Observatory, also known as CTIO. Now, CTIO is a complex that has dozens of different telescopes in it, but the biggest one is this thing called the 4-meter Blanco Telescope. And there it is. Now, does anybody know what these two kind of smudgy objects you can see in the picture are? Guesses? If you had grown up in the Southern Hemisphere, this would be like the most obvious question. You'd be like, why are you asking me that? Because everyone in the Southern Hemisphere can see these er like most nights. Um, that's called the Small Magellanic Cloud and the Large Magellanic Cloud. And those are two galaxies that are right next to the Milky Way galaxy, They're like little dwarf friend galaxies around us. Um, and that was the first time in my life that I got to see those galaxies and the second time on the trip that I cried because I was like, oh my god, I'm seeing these galaxies. So that was exciting. And then the next day, we got to go inside of the 4-meter Blanco telescope. And I just wanted to give you a feel of how big these, production, these operations are and what it feels like to be there when they open up one of the telescope doors. So they'll typically open these up in the afternoon to let the temperature kind of equalize to get ready for the nighttime observing. So the telescope is actually behind us, mixed in with all that equipment. I'll show you a clearer picture in a moment. And then they have to open up these doors to let the starlight in. You can see where we are. And then each one of these other domes that you see down below are other telescopes in the same complex. There's just so many all in this one place. OK, and then there's the telescope. It's a little bit smaller than the Gemini, but still pretty impressive. So let me show you how this works. Uh, the light would come in from the left. That white cover that you see here is covering the telescope mirror to protect it from dust or wind or whatever. And so the light, once they remove that telescope cover, the light would come in, hit this big mirror, and then bounce directly into that big uh, cylinder that you see there. Now that thing is about the size of a van, and it's a camera. <laughs> So imagine, you know, on, a, on your phone or a digital camera, the light comes in the little lens in the front, and then there's like a little tiny chip that picks up the light. That van-sized black thing is the chip <laughs> that picks up the light. Um, it's called the dark energy camera. Now, this telescope was one of the uh, pieces of equipment used to discover that the universe is accelerating its expansion. Did anybody hear about that discovery? It was in the news like 10 years ago. They won a Nobel Prize for this discovery. Um, and this telescope was part of that discovery. So they've put this giant camera on there to try to track exactly how much the expansion is accelerating today and do kind of like follow-up measurements about that. OK, so let's talk about the difference between some different telescopes. It turns out that the size of a telescope is important because that determines how clear the details are going to be in any picture that you try to take. Another way to say that is the surface area of a telescope, like how much surface there is to the mirror or the lens that it uses, determines how clear the resolving power of it. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope is very famous. How many of you have heard of Hubble? How many of you have seen a Hubble picture? Right, pretty much everybody. And a lot of people think, oh, Hubble must be like the biggest telescope because it's so amazing. Hubble's pretty big. It's two and a half meters across. Let me march that off for you so you can see. Starting here, two and a half meters would be about like, about like that. So the mirror on Hubble's that big across. It's hard to put things too much bigger than that up in space because it's expensive <laughs> to launch things on rockets. Um, but anyway, that's the size of Hubble. The Blanco four meter telescope that I just showed you is about like that. Can you picture how big Gemini would be on here? It's about twice as big across. So Gemini actually, just one of the Gemini telescopes, has about nine times more surface area, or about 10 times more surface area than the Hubble Space Telescope. 
So it's a big monster. Now, it turns out that the type of light that you look at also affects how much detail you can see. All of these telescopes look at visible light, the same as what you see with your eyes. But you can also use a telescope to look at radio waves. And radio waves have a very long wavelength. So that means if you want to see something clearly in radio waves, you need a way bigger telescope. So the last place that I'm going to show you, the last observatory, is, um, uses a different kind of light that has longer wavelengths, so the, the telescopes all need to be bigger. So here's a 12-meter <laughs> antenna dish that's used at a place called Alma. And let's take our journey to Alma. OK, now, why does the Alma Observatory use this different kind of light? Well, take a look at this diagram. It shows you how the Earth's atmosphere blocks different wavelengths. The higher up on the graph this line is here, the worse. Like that means that light of that type is getting totally blocked out by the sun. So this diagram is showing you that X-rays, gamma rays, and ultraviolet all get blocked out by the by sorry get blocked out by the Earth's atmosphere. Um, that's good. I mean, we don't want ultraviolet light getting in because it gives us a sunburn, it gives us skin cancer. What about X-rays? Even worse. It always cracks me up when you go to the dentist and you get a dental X-ray taken. What do they do before they take the X-ray? <laughs> they put they put like lead shielding around your body, right? And then what did you say somebody said? They run. They get out of the room. <laughs> like ditch you in there with the x-rays. Like it always cracks me up that you just get abandoned in this danger. It's not a big deal because, you know, you don't get very much of a dose. So I don't want to give anyone a phobia about going to the dentist. It's, it's fine. But, uh, but good news for us, the Earth's atmosphere blocks almost all of the x-rays that come from space. However, the atmosphere does not block visible light, right? Visible light makes it straight through. That's why we can see the sun. That's why we can see stars. But most of these other wavelengths also get blocked except for radio waves. Radio waves also make it straight through. So there are a lot of radio telescopes built on the surface of the Earth just because you can actually see the radio waves from space because the atmosphere doesn't interfere with them too much. Now, the telescope we're about to go to works in the range of one millimeter to one centimeter wavelength. So let's take a look on this chart. Do you notice that one millimeter light gets almost entirely blocked by the Earth's atmosphere? So it seems sort of crazy to build a telescope to try to look for that when it's all going to get absorbed and never even makes it down to the surface of the Earth. So that's the reason why if you want to look at one millimeter light, you got to build your telescope way up high, like 17,000 feet elevation, up above most of the atmosphere. And you got to build it somewhere incredibly dry because water vapor in the atmosphere is one of the main reasons that it absorbs so much of this light. So we're going to visit a place, one of the highest places in the world and one of the driest places in the world, because that's really the only place where we're going to be able to see light of this wavelength and it won't get too much blocked by the atmosphere. Now, to go up very, very high, you're, a lot of people are prone to altitude sickness. So the day before we were about to leave, the hotel we were staying at offered us this. Anybody want to guess what that is? Cocoa, Cocoa leaves, right? Basically like what cocaine is made out of, coca leaves which are legal in, in, um, in Chile. I really wanted to try them, but they told us we were going to have a blood pressure exam right before, and if we took the coca leaves or any form of cocaine, we probably wouldn't pass the blood pressure exam. So I passed on the, on the coca leaves. But then we drove up, uh, started at about 8,000 feet that morning, and then drove up to 10 or 11,000 feet, past some vicuñas and other interesting wildlife on the way up. And then when we actually got to the telescope site, it looked like another planet. This looked like Mars to me when we arrived. It was so dry that everyone on the group was having their finger, like the skin on the back of their fingers cracking and their lips chopping and no amount of lotion could fix it. It was just so dry. It was like sucking the moisture out of your body. And uh, it was so high up that they gave us supplemental oxygen tanks because there wasn't enough air to breathe without getting sick. So we all had oxygen tanks uh, going up there. OK, so the, all, the word Alma stands for Atacama, which is the name of that desert, the Atacama Desert. Large, because it's big. <laughs> Millimeter, because that's the type of, type of light it looks like. Array, which is a group of telescopes. And it's really good at seeing dust and gas. Now, why would you care about dust and gas? Well, dust and gas is what's around newborn, newborn stars. So if you want to see a planet being born, you want to look at dust and gas. And it's also what's around black holes. So if you want to see around the edge of a black hole, you want to look at that too. 
This thing is made up of 66 different antennas. Some of them are 12 meters across, some of them are seven. And it uses a principle called interferometry. It's an interferometer. So this principle works, I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty technical details, but just give you a broad understanding of it. Interferometry, interferometry takes multiple telescopes, gets the signal like radio waves or millimeter waves from space, pipes that into a giant computer system that combines all the different signals together and uses that to simulate one giant telescope that's as big across as the distance between the individual antennas. So you can take 66 antennas and move them around up on this plateau in Chile to simulate telescopes that are up to 16 kilometers or 10 miles across. So that's how this thing works. They take the telescope, sometimes they're all bunched together like 250 meter, a couple football fields across, and then sometimes they drive the individual antennas out to a distance of 10 miles apart from each other, and that simulates a 10 mile across telescope. So the reason you'd wanna move them is if you want to look at something really big in the sky, then you put them close together. It's kind of backwards of what you might think. To look at something big, you put the, the antennas close together, and to look at something small, you have to move them far apart because then you're simulating a bigger telescope which can see tiny, tiny details. So here's a, oh, I forgot I had this in there. My <laughs> sexy picture with the, <laughs> with the oxygen tank. And then um, there's some of the telescopes, the 12 meter telescopes in the array spread out along the plane there. And this area where I'm standing, that's actually one of the small telescopes. That's the seven meter smaller <laughs> telescope. The big ones are 12 meters. That's right in this little area. If we zoom out, this little road coming in here and that shape, that's this right here. And then each of these roads is a path where they would drive the telescopes out to their different locations. The telescopes are so big and heavy that they, have, they, they had to build these custom vehicles with like 14 wheels on the vehicles uh, to drive them around. And to move from one, they go through 10 configurations every year. Like they'll start out with them close together and then they'll spread them apart throughout the year. It takes about three weeks to go from one setup to another because they have to individually load each of these gigantic multi-million dollar precise pieces of equipment onto one of these vehicles, drive it out to its new spot, drop it off. And every one of them has to be located to within a precision of less than one millimeter in the right spot in order for it to work. So that means if, they, if one of those wheels turns half, you know, half a degree too much, they're in the wrong spot and they have to like move it. It's kind of insane that this works. I, like, I can't believe that it works. And there, if we zoom out even more, that whole little lot that I showed you was right there. And then they have little roads that go all the way down to here and here and then back to here and back to here. So they'll take the telescopes and spread them out over this huge 10 mile area. Here's a quick little video to show you what that sort of, it's just an artist's rendering of what this looks like. So basically when the scopes are spread out, the distance between the scopes, or the antennas I should say, um, shows you how big of a telescope they're simulating. So all of these together are es essentially working together to act like a telescope with a mirror that big. Right? So you're making one big telescope out of this array. It's kind of incredible. Okay, so this is, needless to say, this is incredibly complicated, but you get some amazing stuff out of it. So do you remember I told you above Orion's left shoulder was Gemini, above his right shoulder was Taurus. If you go out and look at Taurus and look in between the two brightest stars in Taurus, there's a, a, a star there called HL Tauri. And around that star, there's a new planet system being born. Like new planets are in the process of being born right this moment. And this is an actual photograph of the dust around that star forming into planets. All of the gaps, like the dark spots that you see, are places where maybe there's a planet that, or starting to be born that's sort of disrupting the dust. This is what our solar system looked like uh, a few billion years ago, before the planets existed. And we always thought that's sort of how it happened, but this was the first photographic evidence. And in order to get something like this, you have to build that crazy interferometer giant system because otherwise there's no possible way to see so much detail. So this is one of the amazing things we were able to see with ALMA. Now, ALMA is just a totally unprecedented international project. 
its uh, primary members are North America, Europe, East Asia, and Chile, all working together on this thing. It cost billions and billions of dollars to do. But even that is not big enough to see to the middle of a black, or to, to the edges of a black hole. Black holes are the smallest, most compact objects, and uh, they're incredibly difficult to take pictures of. So difficult that until last year, no one had ever taken a picture of the disk of matter, uh, sorry, of the, of the shadow cast onto the disk of matter around a black hole. No one had ever been able to do it. So in order to take a photo like that, you remember that big old simulated telescope I just showed you? Not even close to big enough. No way. The detail you need to see to look at a black hole is way smaller than that. So I'd like to take you to the main theme and the one thing I want you to take away from my talk today, which is in order to see deeper into space, you need a bigger telescope, but not just bigger in its diameter, bigger in its, I want to say, its imagination, in its courage, and the audacity to even try it. You got to think so big that you involve the entire world in your project and work together in order to do it. So last year, there was a group who decided they wanted to look at the center of the M87 galaxy. That's the one where I told you, just look out to the east, find some blank spot, and imagine, OK, that's where that huge galaxy is. So this is a giant galaxy with billions and billions of stars in it. And do you see that yellow? Anybody know what that yellow blob is in the middle? That's just the composite light of like billions of stars that are so close together that they're shining almost as one from our point of view. Right in the middle of that, there is a supermassive black hole that's so unstable that it's causing this giant jet of material about 5,000 light years long to blast out of, its, um, out of its center. And it's just an amazing object. So they wanted to take a picture of what's at the middle of this thing. In order to do that, they built a telescope that was this big. So they took the array of telescopes that I showed you and hooked it up together with um, radio telescopes all the way around the world and you remember how that picture looked, like a big circle encompassing all the telescopes? So by doing this, they created a simulated telescope the size of our planet. And that's finally big enough to see a black hole. And so we got this picture last year, the one on the left. That's the first ever photograph of black hole, no longer a theoretical object. Like we have photographic evidence that they exist. On the right, that shows you if ALMA, the thing that your taxpayer dollars are going towards, if ALMA hadn't been part of the collaboration, they wouldn't have been able to get the picture. The picture would have looked like that, and you wouldn't have been able to see the black hole. So I'm super grateful that we work together with ALMA and we help support it. On, the last, on my last day at ALMA, we got to meet the director of the observatory. He's uh, the one right here. Might not seem that impressive to you, but to an astronomy geek like myself, that's like meeting the NFL commissioner, like getting to have lunch with him. It's kind of crazy. I mean, he oversees an insane budget, international collaboration. It's just a crazy thing. So I got, to ask, I, I got to ask him a question, and I asked him, if I was going to go back to people in America and talk about your observatory, what's the one thing you would want me to tell them? And he said, I would like you to try as best you can to convey to them just how insane this project is and what a big deal it is that we actually got all of these countries to work together and made it work. And if we can, and he said, if we can get so many countries to collaborate on something this complicated and actually have it work, I believe we can do anything together in the world. Like we can actually collaborate and solve the world's problems together. So that was a very hopeful message for me when thinking about things like climate change, stuff like that. I know climate change is a bigger problem than this. But this is really complicated. And a bunch of countries got together and worked it out and, and made it work. So I'll leave you with that. That was all I had to say. So I can open it up, if we have time, to some questions. Let's see, thank you. Oh, thank you. Any questions? Can, the question was, can anybody get up to the sites where, where I was? The first two that I showed you, um, you can. I, I don't think you can always go up at night. They have like special events where occasionally you might be able to go up at night, but they have like daytime tours, and you can drive up. Um, the, yeah, the crazy bus trip, you can take it. Probably the same driver. Um, good luck. <laughs> um, but the last place I showed you, no. Um, only the site, the, the high site that I, sh that I showed you, I think only like 200 people have ever been there. 
So there's like a lot more people who have been to Mount Everest than have been up to that site. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Is that snow that we saw? It was snow, yeah. It does snow there, and then uh, it, uh, it gradually sublimates. But uh, yeah. <laughs> It is extremely dry, but it does occasionally snow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, another question? Oh. Hey, it was just about the telescopes themselves, like the big one, the you know, the Gemini one. Sure. So are those telescope telescopes, they kind of like cameras in a way where they do just a series of images <coughs> and they reflect and then see what's going on out there? And it's just like the observing of that? It is sort of like that, yeah. It, it's basically. Um, a honeycomb style mirror, I believe, actually, no, I'm not sure, but it's a big, huge mirror. All the light comes in and hits this big mirror, reflects onto a second mirror, and then focuses down onto a detector. Now, what will happen is on a camera or a phone, you've got a hard built in chip called a CCD chip on the back after the light comes in, and it picks up the light, and it's probably in your phone just attached to the circuit board and can't really move. So on the Gemini telescope, there's this system of mirrors to direct the light to the chip. But then instead of a chip, there's a hole. And then there's like six different giant, like um, imagine a really big table stood upright. Um, they've got like six different things of those on the back of the telescope that they can rotate into place so that different detectors can sit there. So it's like you have your choice of six different chips that you want to use, and then they can use them. And then throughout the year, they'll pull those off and put different ones on. So some of them are picking up infrared light. Some of them are picking up visible light. Some are for that, like planet finding. And they're all optimized for different things. So it's like the, the, the mirror part works pretty similar to just a normal telescope. But then the detector is crazy complicated. And there's lots of different ones on there. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. So how did, how did you get involved with the, the Chile Ambassadors uh, Educational Program? How did I get involved with yeah. the Chile Educational Ambassadors Program? Yeah. Um, I saw a posting on Facebook <laughs> to apply from one of my friends who's an astronomer. And uh, I had always wanted to go to Chile, but I didn't know how to get there and actually get the behind the scenes access. So I applied and I promised them I was going to give a series of talks afterwards about the telescopes. <laughs> and they said, oh, OK, why don't you come along? So they, they chose me to go with them. It's actually a competitive process. Um, and I think eight people were selected to, to go on the trip this year. Yeah. OK. Yeah, one more. Do people live there? Like, it seems really far away. That's a great question. There. Yeah. Um, so the question was, do people live there? It seems really far away. So at the one at the top, um, they have crews who work. There's 200 people that work at the observatory. And they come up in shifts. So they, most of them live in Santiago, which is like an airplane right away. And some of them live in the town that's a, like a few hours drive away, San Pedro de Atacama. Um, but what they'll do is they'll come up for like either a two week shift or whatever they've got worked out for their schedule. And then they'll go back home to Santiago and someone else will come up to take their place. They've got like a dormitory there and people kind of hot bunk where it's like one guy lives in this room for two weeks. He shoves his stuff in the closet, goes home, and the other guy comes in and uses the same room. I actually met a person there who lived in Scotland and was working at the observatory. So he would, and he had a young child. So he would come for four weeks to work, and then he'd fly home to Scotland for four weeks, and then he'd come back for four weeks to work again. He said he was having a little bit of stress in his marriage. <laughs> I said, that sounds about right. That sounds like a crazy, crazy thing. So yeah, it's a really weird situation. But that area of Chile has some of the biggest mines in the world, like copper mines and metal mines. And there are a lot of workers that are like that um, who go up to the mines for a few weeks and then go back home. So it's sort of something that in Chile, is, there's already a sort of system in place for living that way. There's a lot of people who live that work that way. So it's not as unusual as it would be here. Although I still think it's really, really weird and seems stressful. Yeah. All right, other questions? Yeah, what well, question? Is there a chance that in the future we would send telescopes uh, into orbit around the, the sun to get a larger like dish area to take more detailed pictures? That's a great question. I don't know of any plans like in the works to actually do that, like, like that are funded or have formal proposals. But I know that people are thinking about that. And for sure, I think there's a possibility. I would love to see us 
plant telescopes like on the moons of the outer solar system or something like that and uh, and build like do a simulated telescope that way it would be really complicated though like part of the reason that it works uh, now is we can take all of the data and combine it pretty easily and I forgot to say that but if you go back to the well if you go back to the event horizon telescope that picture of the whole world the way that they send the, combine the data it turns out there's so many terabytes of data it's insane that the fastest way to transmit the data is to load it into big boxes full of hard drives and put them on private jets and fly them around the world um, to a central data center. So it would be incredibly difficult. The hardest part of doing what you're suggesting would be the data transmission mm -hmm. because um, a lot of the scopes that we have out there or um, spacecraft that we have out there now, there's a real bottleneck. Like they'll set, they've got their little antenna that they use to transmit stuff back to Earth and their little battery that's probably solar powered and takes hours and hours to send pictures back to planet Earth. So getting enough data <laughs> to combine it, that I think would be the hard part. Maybe they could use like laser encoding or something like that. But yeah, yeah it's, it's certainly something to think about. It's just a technical challenge how to pull it off. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Have a good day.